Friday download. This is episode 15 coming to you on Monday, the 30th of March, a few days later than our normal publication day. My apologies for this. One of the things I've struggled with or hesitated with for this podcast and this, this episode is the kind of content needed right now. You will have noticed for the last couple of episodes, we've put aside the US political content and focused in on COVID 19 and the response. And I'll continue to do that over the coming weeks with a number of discussions planned where we look at the ongoing implications of COVID, how it might change the way we interact, travel and trade with the world. On this theme, in a special episode, I spoke with Daniel Thomas, long-standing Chicago resident, CEO and president of creative communications agency Time Zone One. His agency has a heavy weighting of travel and tourism clients in both New Zealand and the United States. So his thoughts on the current and future impacts and how his clients are responding was particularly insightful. Check that episode out, particularly if you have an interest in the travel and tourism sectors. Over the coming weeks, like I said, we'll do a mix of COVID-focused episodes with other episodes that continue to highlight the nature of the NZUS trade relationship. today's episode I'm joined by Stephen Jacoby for a discussion on the response to COVID-19 and how trade policy can both contribute to or indeed complicate a public health care response like the one we are experiencing right now. Stephen is Executive Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum, former Executive Director of both the NZ US Council and NZ China Council. He's a former Ministerial Trade Advisor and Diplomat. So here's the issue. Global supply chains are highly interdependent. Final goods often involve component parts sourced from all over the world. And in other situations, economies have advantages, which means they dominate the supply of particular goods. In the context of medical supplies and the coronavirus, not many nations are able to produce all the medical supplies they need to respond effectively to this pandemic and many nations will face shortages, especially as healthcare systems come under greater pressure. This means governments must go abroad to source these medical supplies, and that's where trade policy comes into play. We're seeing with PPEs, personal protective equipment, some governments hoarding these essential supplies, going on global buying missions, building stockpiles, and or limiting exports where they have a local manufacturing capability. It raises immediate questions over how we can keep the trade in these essential supplies flowing, and more longer term questions on how do we avoid the emergency protective measures that have been rolled out in nations all over the world becoming entrenched, and what changes will need to be made to the nature of supply chains to diversify risk and reduce vulnerabilities. We look at these questions and others during our discussion. But before we get to that, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to your favourite podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google and most other podcast services. We also have a new podcast website, www.fridaydownload.nz, so that's www.fridaydownload.nz, where you can listen to our current and or past episodes, subscribe to the podcast and a podcast newsletter. Thanks Stephen for joining me today. How are you doing? Well, good to be with you and uh, yeah, we're doing fine here in uh, lockdown in Mount Eden. Uh, I'm here with my wife and my daughter and my son-in-law in our bubble. Uh, we're sort of trying to observe something of a routine, uh, and uh, in the afternoons we're to be seen exercising on the deck. So, uh, uh, you know, it's an unusual experience. We're not completely cut off from the world, but uh, certainly feels like it. 
Yeah. And, and how do you feel, you know, the lockdown's being respected there in your community? Well, I think actually reasonably well. I haven't been to the supermarket myself. That's uh, uh, Jack, our designated supermarket uh, <laughs> a shopper, who went last week. He said it was uh, all pretty calm and orderly. Uh, we've been out walking around the neighbourhood and people seem to be obeying the two metre distance. Uh, you know, we had a, a, um, a link up with our church, 45 of us on Zoom the other day, so I mean, uh, you know, on Sunday. So all that seems to be going uh, reasonably well. I can see on my Twitter feed, though, uh, and on my social media, kind of neighbourhood parties and people throwing fris- frisbees and things. I'm not sure that's in the spirit of it, but oh well. Um, I hope everybody can just stay at home. Yeah, yeah. I certainly, I, I live um, in central Wellington and it's very quiet here. Uh, I live close to uh, the, you know, Highway 1 that goes via the, you know, by the Terrace Tunnel and, uh, yeah, the traffic is very quiet. So hopefully that's a good sign uh, here in Wellington. Well, we're not far away from, we're not far away from Mount Eden Road and normally we can hear a kind of a, Rumble in the distance, but that's gone, and now we can hear the birds, yeah. which is uh, even better. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I, I noticed that the other day when I was uh, going down to my garage. Yeah, um, I think it was a wood pigeon, um, and I was like, oh, I've never heard that here before. So, um, you know, that's a that's one positive, <laughs> I guess. Hey, um, so where I'm hoping to start the conversation today is by looking at um, some of the trade issues that are. Uh, currently challenging the public health care response to the virus and in a recent quote a recent blog post you quote that 50 governments are now limiting access to the essential tools to fight the pandemic imposing export restrictions on medical equipment and drugs many more are maintaining tariffs on even the most basic protective items such as soap and disinfectant what what do some of these restrictions look like? Uh, what, what are um, a few a few examples? Yes, well, look, this is a, um, a preoccupying um, feature of the situation we're now in. I mean, clearly, uh, trade is suffering all sorts of challenges uh, at the moment, and so is the movement of goods through supply chains. But it seems to be a particular issue that's arisen around the very tools we need to fight uh, the pandemic. And I'm thinking of things like um, masks, protective equipment, hand sanitizer, soap. There are a variety of different um, uh, impositions of things like export bans uh, for countries that produce those sorts of products, increased tariffs, um, difficulty moving these things uh, through the supply chain. Um, I have to say that this is pretty prevalent in parts of Europe uh, and in some parts of Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, that is concerning because uh, to be able to fight this pandemic, what we know is that economies can't just do it by themselves. Some are in better positions than others, clearly, in terms of their productive capacity. Uh, but trade is a way in which this can be shared more widely, and we will all benefit if the world can get rid of this pandemic uh, sooner uh, rather than later. So. Uh, there have been a number of calls now to um, uh, reverse these export bans, which seems to be the most prevalent uh, problem. Uh, and uh, the APEC Business Advisory Council has just written to APEC ministers, for example, uh, reinforcing that. We've had the B20 reinforce that with the G20. So there are, the international chambers of commerce have done it. Uh, there are lots of international business organisations that are doing this. Uh, then it's about tariffs on... Uh, some of these um, products, uh, the ones I've just mentioned, the protection equipment, hand sanitizer and soap. Some countries have raised tariffs in the last couple of weeks. Obviously, that's got to be stopped. We need to stand still on that sort of thing. I mean, it's about rolling back those tariffs as we move forward. Yeah. And you say there needs to be a stop to those sorts of activities. What, what are the available options there at this particular point in time? Well, uh, I guess the best available option is the countries do it because it's the right thing to do, a kind of a unilateral measure in exactly the same way that they've put, it, put them on. Uh, the other way uh, that needs to be done uh, it would be through the WTO. Uh, there could be a multilateral initiative to try to declare such being illegal. Now, you know the state of the WTO at the moment 
know, the difficulties of actually um, doing anything. Um, that seems to be um, um, uh, uh, an important route to be followed, but one that's not going to give a lot of um, outcome in the immediate term. So what we need to do is we need to get smaller groups of um, economies like in APEC or like in G20 to be able to put moral suasion on each other to be able to police that sort of thing and put it in place. So, so at the moment, if a larger, more powerful country is, is hoarding medical supplies and equipment, there aren't too many options for a smaller country such as New Zealand? There are very few options. And um, uh, you know, if we think it's difficult for New Zealand, think about the countries of the two-thirds world, yeah. uh, and um, particularly the poorest. You know, and if we see this um, virus getting into parts of Africa, uh, then I think um, we are facing an even bigger global calamity. So I think the best way <clears throat> at the moment are for uh, APEC, WHO, the business, international business organisations, the UN, the IMF, all of those ones, and the WTO, uh, to use the sort of moral suasion argument to try and get these economies um, focused on the need to do this. Mm. That's why, by the way, our government... Uh, very successfully, and all credit to David Parker and Gellis Vitalis, who's been leading this, has now got a group of countries willing to work together, a group of economies willing to work together to do this. Yeah. And they're continuing to add more. So, you know, trade policy isn't stopping in this time. It's just taking on a different um, a different character. Yeah. And so you're, you're referring to the trade minister's, oh, the, the ministerial statement, right, where a number of other trade ministers have signed up to pledge to keep trade routes open. Is that That's right. Yeah. So it started with New Zealand and Singapore and has now gone to a whole bunch of other countries, Australia, Canada, Chile, uh, even Myanmar, I know. Just, so um, uh, Brunei, a whole lot of them now coming on board. And I gather that work is still continuing. Mm. Can, can you tell me a, a little bit about that? And what's the significance of this statement and... Is it? Well, I think the idea is it's trying to get a block of countries together, or a group, maybe block's not the right word, but certainly a, par- a partnership, yeah. uh, a trans-global partnership uh, of, of, of economies together who can exercise this voice uh, for moral suasion in whatever international setting they have, whether through APEC trade ministers, through uh, WTO, all these other areas. Getting the, the, the economies together, I think, is a key part. And I guess it's what New Zealand has always done, isn't it? It's not just a time of crisis. This is what we did around TPP, for example, to get it going. This is what we're doing in relation to new efforts around the digital economy through DEPA or the, the climate change partnership we've got going. Um, but, I mean, this is a, it might seem like a, a very difficult mountain to climb. I'm sure it is, but it's work that needs to continue. You know, I, I look at this current pandemic response. Um, I think what it shows us every single day is that uh, you know this virus has no respect for borders, and That's borders, right. you know, borders, borders actually provide very uh, poor protection. And that in a you know post coronavirus world what we'll need is much stronger international organisations and closer international cooperation. So other than trade policy and trade rules, are there other international rule sets that could help at the moment? So help with the allocation of resources during this crisis or do we need to be looking at a future set of a future international organisation or regime that could help us out when the next pandemic strikes? Well, I think that's uh, uh, that's a very salient question, Jordan, isn't it? And I think um, I'm sure you, like me, were have been dismayed to see that cover of The Economist a week or so ago that had a globe and, 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 and the word closed yeah. on it. You know, it's a kind of a very opposite of things that organisations that we're involved with, like the NZUS Council or the International Business Forum and APEC and others, want to see. I mean, we've always seen the value of openness. But openness by itself, I guess, something we always knew, uh, can't, and which we're now finding that now, openness by, by itself isn't enough. We actually have to have cooperation as well. 
And we are seeing now the difficulty that we've got into by neglecting vital international organisations like the World Trade Organisation, which is not there to do the job, or it is there, but not in quite the way we might have wanted it. It's not there to do the job that we might have, uh, that we need right now. Have we devoted enough time to the UN cooperation mechanisms? Um, certainly the WHO isn't very much in our minds at the moment about how vital that is. I mean, in times that are, that are, that are, good and when things are functioning you never need to think about these things or you think you don't but it's precisely in those times that we need to put in place um, these sorts of global good uh, organizations and um, clearly after this terrible crisis is over and goodness knows when that's going to be it will have to engender some sort of reflection about whether the instruments uh, we had at our disposal were adequate and whether we had invested enough in them. I mean, I'm closer to the trade side of the question and in the WTO, I can tell you, we haven't. Uh, and we've known it. We've been saying it for years. Now we're realising um, what we are now, what, 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 what we're facing. If you, if you think back to previous crises and pre- previous events that have triggered a rethink of you know, instruments, institutions, etc. What is what has it taken to get that sort of rethink happening? Actually, I fear that the the track record is not very good. Yeah. Uh, because if you think about the global economic crisis we've had, the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, um, the world gradually has shrugged off those things, and we haven't. Followed, you know, followed through on the things that we said we would do uh, to stop those things happening again. I mean, each one has been different, and this one's different too. Um, but I, I'm not sure that it did uh, lead to a strengthening of the sort of multilateral cooperation instruments that we have at our disposal. Uh, and um, the world has a very, very short memory when it comes to these things. And... Um, I, I, I think even that's probably a learning. I mean, the global financial crisis is a good, a good uh, example to think about. You know, obviously in New Zealand we weren't as affected as many other um, economies around the world, largely because we had um, Australian banks that didn't get mixed mixed up in, in dodgy lending, and because uh, we had the burgeoning Chinese market to rely on. So we kind of, and this is not to say it didn't make an impact on New Zealand's economy, it certainly did, and in our um, you know, debt and all that sort of stuff for a short period of time, but we clawed our way back from that quite significantly, quite, quite substantially. However, this time, uh, all our markets are affected, all our financial instruments are affected, and we haven't really, um, I don't think, necessarily learnt the lessons of international cooperation. And globalisation. After this is over, there is going to be a reckoning, uh, without a doubt. The world's not going to look exactly the same in the future as it did in the past. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I think that we're going to see a different approach to the way business is done globally. Uh, we're going to see a shortening of supply chains. I don't think we're going to see all of this called into question immediately um, yes. by any means. But we are going to see much greater attention paid to resilience. The worry is that over time. When we get back to the old way of doing things and the past starts again, we won't um, remember. Uh, I think in another area, by the way, uh, that's key is in relation to climate change. You know, clearly the world's got a bit of a reprieve um, because of declining economic activity. The climate change indicator is going to start to look a bit better, but we actually think about this as we go forward. Um, I have to say, the, uh, the record, as I say, is not very good, but let's hope that's not the case. Mm. Yeah, let's... Yeah, some big big questions there. Um, I want to bring the discussion back to protectionism and really look more long term, as best we can at this point, um, because still early days. But what? So uh, yeah, so I want to look long term, um, which you know can be hard to do during a crisis, but it is what we do need to be doing right now to ensure that we return yeah, in the fastest possible manner to open trade, travel, investment. And I guess, you know, one of the real concerns is that post 
coronavirus, that these current sort of temporary emergency measures become tomorrow's rules. That as we continue Mm -hmm. to see barriers to trade and travel and investment, that they become locked in, that, you know, countries start thinking about or reverting to being, you know, self sufficient in the production of things like medical equipment, antibiotics, vaccines and other resources considered to be critical or essential. Is this a concern to you? Is this something you're thinking about? Look, it's a huge concern because protectionism was already a problem um, before the virus uh, took took hold. And we were seeing uh, that it was protectionism that was continuing to stifle the economic recovery. You know, we could have got this uh, global economy humming much sooner coming out of the global financial crisis, but for the protectionism that was being put in place. You know, when, uh, as I said earlier, the, econ- the global economy was already having, already having difficulty affording it, uh, and it's now got worse. And, uh, you know, by the way, we talked this morning about, um, you know, medical supplies, medical equipment, but we're seeing some bans being put in place on food, uh, which is, seems, seems even more ridiculous. But, um, uh, again, the, the response... Uh, for economies is often to think about locking down. And, um, of course, in the, during the virus, there's some good reasons to lock down borders for passenger movements, but mm. we're talking about trade here. Uh, um, and uh, it, it's very difficult to get those sorts of things um, unwound afterwards. So, yes, protectionism is bad. It was bad before the virus. It's bad after the virus. It's bad medicine. It's not going to be the sort of thing that's going to help get those engines of trade and investment started up again. So again, it's about declaring a standstill. It's about rolling back what we've got, but we need the international institutions to be able to police that sort of thing and to put in place, you know, co-op, you know, arrangements between economies that enable that uh, to happen. So, yeah, we're a big problem going forward, I think. Yeah. And um, we're going to have to work on that in the future as well. Mm. well what's, so you mentioned a ban on food. I haven't heard. I certainly heard the ban. Yeah, on very uh, not 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 mm. not bans on food um, mm. across the board, but on some um, foodstuffs considered um, um, uh, considered staples. For example, Vietnam, I believe, has put one on rice. Oh, okay. um, you know, uh, I mean, this is the old reflex coming back. It's the sort of thing we've been trying to talk about in APEC for a long time about the food system. We need a you know, we need food to be flowing so that supply and demand can match up around the region at the best of times and at the worst of times. Hey, so so as the pandemic sort of ripples through the world economy, there are some serious questions being asked about our global supply chains and how they work. And we've, we've touched upon this already in the discussion. And um, specifically the dependence on China for medical supplies and the vulnerability this creates. And there is an expectation that companies will likely come under pressure to diversify where they make their products and source their component parts. What are your thoughts on this kind of argument and, um, and trend? Well, I, yes, yes, indeed. Well, well, I think that, um, as I say, the future is going to look different, and uh, I think there's going to be a much greater emphasis placed on supply chain resilience uh, going forward. I think diversification, um, at the best of times, is important, uh, both in where you're selling and from where you're buying, and that uh, that that is going to uh, uh, continue. I don't think we are going to see the wholesale dismantling of, of some of the supply chains that exist, but I think there might be a lot of tension placed on on the length of those supply chains uh, and on the um, the rules that apply within them. Uh, and uh, I think that um, uh, the, the 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 big issue uh, going forward is the extent to which um, uh, new supply chains can be uh, can be established. I mean, there are reasons why. <laughs> Um, things are made in China, uh, certain things are made in China, certain things are made in the United States, and certain things are made in New Zealand even. 
Uh, so um, some of those economic reasons may not go away uh, too too quickly, but I think there will be some thought about the resilience of those supply chains going forward. Mm. Yeah. So there is this argument forming around um, you know, widening the zone of. Uh, it's again, it's related to the medical supply area about widening the zone of non-China you know, medical sourcing. And um, and it's it's a U.S. argument that you need to move beyond this America first um, idea and actually be looking at you know, a market that you know is a, perhaps a billion person market of proven and trusted partners um, where you could see some of the benefits of a secure supply. Uh, captured at you know significant significantly lower cost, um, and that you know there's this I guess this push or this argument for the US uh, joining rejoining uh, TPP uh, for all of those reasons, the big market uh, trusted partners. What, what do you make of that kind of argument? I haven't articulated it very well, but I think you probably get the gist of it. Well, um, there's sort of a different number of things there, aren't there? Um, uh, you know, the idea that um, you know new supply chains or uh, and manufacturing manufacturing supply chains, I guess we're talking about, could be put in place to diversify the risk away from any one partner seems to be a, a, a not an unreasonable um, um, proposition. It may be more complicated to do than it seems. And I remember, ironically, it was in the, the, the Hubei province around Wuhan that was the Chinese centre for the manufacture of a lot of these medical um, products. So not only did not only there was, a, was there a problem for the world, um, in fact, that this centre got closed down, it was actually a problem for China. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think that, that, that but, but I think extending that out uh, in new ways could be more complicated than. Um, than it seems, um, but I don't know who who knows how this might um, evolve in the future. Again, as I said, there are very good reasons why this has evolved, and um, a lot of it is involved, by the way, in China with American investment, and um, uh, uh, you know for reasons that um, that, are, that are fairly plain to see. Uh, but when it comes to establishing other networks of 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 um, trading partners built around common values and common rules and common expectations. Well, that's not a new thing either. That's been around for a long time. And uh, even New Zealand, uh, which had, of course, privileged position in the Chinese market, has been very keen to get TPP up and running. That's why we reached out to the Americans in the first place, why we got them on board and why the deal was done, only to see it not being able to be um, realised. Now, specifically in relation to the United States and, and um, TPP, well, some things have changed there. Um, uh, obviously, the president's views on, on agreements like this haven't changed. But, but um, uh, the, the, to get the USMCA, the Canada-Mexico agreement, through the Senate, through the Congress, uh, it was necessary to amend some of the US traditional uh, positions on IP that had proven a real hassle in the former TPP negotiation, and which were why the president, President Obama, that is, could not get the agreement through Congress in the first place. They have been alleviated, so they don't present quite the same problem anymore. The United States is not going to be, assumed, one assumes anyway, um, seeking those same sort of agreements in a new look TPP, so that makes it easier for them to join on. But I think the bigger problem is that they will still have to make concessions to everybody else. Uh, in terms of opening their own market to allow, to enable people uh, to welcome them back in. But even for a big country like the United States, the traffic can't all be one way. And, um, uh, you know, New Zealand has its very interests, obviously, agricultural interests, but other countries have got their interests, Vietnam, Japan, a lot of these countries have got um, things they want to achieve in the United States, and the United States will have to make that possible. So if you are wanting to establish a new set of uh, arrangements with trusted partners uh, uh, to diversify risk 
in times of crisis and outside it, you still have to be willing to open up your own market. And whether that is going to be something the United States is prepared to contemplate, I'm not so sure. Mm. Yeah, I think it's just, uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows where that will go? Hey, um, I mean, I need to say, I need to say though, Jordan, that I hope it will. Yeah. I mean, uh, I hope it will. You know, I, as you know very well, I spent uh, over 10 years of my life trying to get that uh, um, uh, opening in the United States. I haven't abandoned the idea. I think it would be extremely positive uh, uh, if that were the case. And um, just seeing how it might be able to happen that is a bit harder. Will, the, will this crisis, you know, cause the administration to rethink some of these things, I'm a little dubious, but um, um, uh, yeah, as you say, let's see, let's hope. Mm. Could, could you see, you know, sectoral agreements around you know, medical supplies or medical equipment? Oh, potentially. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and around a whole range of things. I mean, this is the, this is by the way, this is a feature, as you know, yeah. not just in relation to New Zealand and the United States. It's a global feature now. Okay, we yeah. can't make. Progress on the big bang of a WTO round with you know substantial elimination of tariffs and whatever and barriers on all goods. So let's just all services. Let's just look those ones where it's easy. And of course, those things can be done. Um, although actually sometimes it's not quite as easy as even those areas that it looks. But anyway, they can be done. The trouble is you never get around to the things that mostly interest us in New Zealand, which is our um, agricultural um, interests. But maybe. Uh, in the world today, um, um, there's been a change there because um, uh, the world actually wants to buy what we have to sell. It's a huge, a huge change. I mean, it certainly applied before the virus. I think it's going to apply post the virus uh, uh, equally. That um, we've got things here that the world wants, uh, and uh, that puts us in a slightly different position than maybe we've been in the past. Mm. I just want to wrap it up by. Just asking you, what 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 do you think New Zealand businesses and exporters need to be thinking about at this time, in respect of trade, trade policy, and I guess the, the global landscape? Well, they've got to be thinking about survival. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that um, this trade policy discussion is um, at, at, at the best of times quite verified. Yes. It's even more so right now. <laughs> Our companies, our sectors need to be thinking about survival. They need to go to be thinking about making sure they can get through this year um, uh, with their workforce, hopefully in, 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 as intact as they possibly can. They you've got to be careful about shedding too much capacity because uh, when the rebound comes, I do think people will want what we've got. Uh, they've got to be, to the extent that's able, showing up there. Um, uh, their partners around the world, uh, which is going to be hard because they can't visit, they can't, but they've got to use the digital means to um, uh, uh, to do this. They've really got to be co- uh, focused on on preserving themselves for the next phase. And uh, that will come, just when, we don't know. And, uh, I, you know, I know that all our, our, our people are incredibly resilient, but this is a hard time for everybody. Is there anything I've missed or any other points you want to make? No, I think you, we've, we've, we've covered the ground. I mean, I think the things that helped us in um, the global financial crisis, as I mentioned, our banking and financial systems, our, um, our the, the partnerships we have around the world uh, uh, are going to help us in this next, in, in this crisis as well, at least on the economic side. And I think we've got the government working very proactively, very strongly to contain this problem back home, to preserve our people, which is the most important thing. Saving lives is the thing that's most on everyone's minds at the moment. We want a a part to play in that. But at some point, we will need to start thinking about the future. In fact, somebody needs to be thinking about it now. Um, uh, And well, apart from, you know, being Alice Vitalis in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, and others. Uh, But um, uh, we've got to... um, uh, prepare for this, uh, the future that is coming, even while we look after what we're doing today. So, no, great discussion, Jordan. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for joining me today. It has been a, um, yeah, interesting and insightful uh, discussion, and, and you're right. Um, 
perhaps that's you know, that's the role that you know our organisations should be playing is to you know, be looking ahead and um, you know, together with you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and others, um, and you know keeping an eye out on on the future and you know uh, what some of the concerns are there, but you know also what do we want it to look like um, coming out of this? So um, I think it's been a useful uh, discussion, and um, yeah, thanks again for joining me. Cheers, all the best in the lockdown. Yeah, same to you. Stay home, stay <laughs> sure. safe. Absolutely. Wash your hands. Yes. Thanks again, Stephen, for joining me and sharing your thoughts on the immediate and long-term trade policy concerns during these times. As Stephen rightly says, the primary focus must be on public health. Following the lockdown rules, the immediate survival of New Zealand businesses and exporters, and then some of the, these trade concerns. I totally agree. You can find Stephen's bio details in the episode notes. I've also included links to a number of articles that I found useful in the preparation for this episode. Thanks to Michael Jeffrey, NZUS Council intern, who researches and promotes the podcast each week. Your thoughts on the show are always welcome. My contact details can be found in the episode notes. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. That's another episode down, a quickish download for your lockdown listening. I'm Jordan Small. Join me later this week for the Friday Download. Thank you.